Hi everyone. Almost from its beginnings, fugue theory in general, and especially theories concerning the structure of the subject and answer, have suffered from a disparity between theory and practice. Even Johann Fuchs's discussion of fugue in Gradasad Parnassum doesn't accurately reflect how he himself composed. In short, comparison of Fuchs's treatise with his own music reveals a certain distance between Fuchs the prescriber of rules and Fuchs the creator of beautiful music. That is, as a theorist, Fuchs felt it necessary to provide the student with detailed specific rules for the attainment of perfection, while as a composer he was careful to subordinate those rules to his own musical instincts and creativity. Along with the gap between theory and practice, many theorists, especially those around the late 19th and early 20th centuries, developed an apparent need to improve with their own suggestions what composers had written. Ebenezer Prout, for example, claims the character of the following fugue subject is entirely ruined by the monotonous repetition of the Fs in the answer, and feels it would have been improved by a real answer. Prout makes this claim despite Handel and many other composers often using repeated notes in their fugal answers. Traditionally, therefore, fugue theory is a minefield of misinformation, exceptions and a prevalence of strict rules, many of which were not observed by the composers. In this video, rather than discuss the fugue subject in terms of rules, I'll focus on what composers actually wrote and will attempt to show how a number of features common to the structure of fugue subjects within a fugue's exposition has allowed such a variety of works to be written. Fugue subjects are of two types, real and tonal. Real subjects, possibly the older of the two, preserve exactly in the answer the subject's intervallic content. For example, here the answer reproduces the subject's melodic contour but begins on the dominant note. while tonal subjects alter part of the answer's melodic contour, such as here, where in the opening part the initial leap from B-flat to F, the first and fifth degrees in B-flat minor, is answered by the leap from F to B-flat in the next part. The alternation in tonal subjects between the first and fifth degrees of the fugue's tonic key is a topic I'll discuss in more detail shortly. Their use, however, divides the octave into a perfect fifth pentachord and perfect fourth tetrachord, helping to define the key, whereas in a real subject the answer can potentially exceed the octave. Here, for example, the subject beginning on the tonic note D is framed by a perfect fifth interval spanning its length, and the real answer using the same structure but beginning on the dominant note A reaches the note E at the upper limits of its perfect fifth span, thereby exceeding the D octave limit. It should be noted that whether a real subject answer pair exceeds the tonic octave limit is dependent on the shape of the subject. Here in another fugue with real subject, for example, the subject's melodic contour spans only a diminished fourth. The subject answer pair therefore remains within the C-sharp octave limit.
even with tonal subjects, whether an octave limit is maintained in the subject answer pair is dependent upon the subject's melodic contour. In tonal works, however, regardless of melodic contour, if the subject contains a perfect fifth between its first and fifth degrees, the answer will contain a perfect fourth and vice versa. For example, in this fugue, the leap from F to B flat in the second part creates a complete octave with the initial B flat F notes of the first part's entry. After this has occurred, however, the melodic contour of the subject answer pair exceeds the B flat octave limit. Another common feature of many fugue subjects is the inclusion in their melodic contours of scale degrees 1 and 5, which as we'll see, depending on the type of fugue subject, may use the first and fifth degrees of the tonic key throughout the subject answer pair, or may include instead in the answer the equivalent notes of the dominant chord or key. As with most features of fugal writing, there are no set rules for how these notes should be incorporated into the fugue subject. Among the many ways in which these degrees may be incorporated include each subject and answer entry begins with a leap either between the first and fifth or fifth and first degrees of the tonic key, but then conclude with other notes. In this example, the subject concludes on the median and the answer on the flat and seventh of B flat minor. Scale degrees 1 and 5 of the tonic key begin the subject and answer pair with the beginning notes also concluding the entries. Here D-sharp begins and concludes the subject, and A-sharp does the same in the answer. The first and fifth degrees of the tonic key conclude the subject and answer entries but are framed by other notes within the subject's overall shape. Here for example the subject concludes on the first degree and the answer on the fifth degree of F-sharp major. Within the subject's contour the first and fifth degrees of F-sharp major are initially used here as part of a leap with the two degrees separated by a rest and here as part of a stepwise ascent. Because this is a real answer, the same notes in the dominant occur in equivalent locations in the answer. The subject and answer begin and end with the same scale degree, either 1 or 5. Here the real answer also includes in its melodic contour the tonic note, here sounding at the top of its shape, while the subject's ascent reaches only A before returning to E. A similar subject usage occurs in this fugue, although here, because of its shape, neither subject nor answer includes the other scale degree, with the subject beginning and ending on the first degree and the answer on the fifth degree. And finally, the subject and answer may be framed by scale degrees 1 and 5 of the tonic key. Here the subject begins on the fifth and concludes on the first, and the answer reverses this arrangement.
Modulating subjects or subjects which tonicize the dominant chord also tend to contain the first and fifth degrees of the relevant key. We've already seen in this example how the real answer here replicates in the dominant the move between degrees 1 and 5 of the tonic key. Here also, within the contour of the real subject scale, degrees 1 and 5 in the key of E minor are then replicated in the dominant B minor. Chromatic subjects also, although potentially freer in their modulatory ability, will typically anchor the chromaticism within tonality by incorporating scale degrees 1 and 5 in their melodic contour. In this chromatic fugue subject by Cherubini, for example, here although originally planned to use a tonal answer, Cherubini decided that this would have made the working of the counter subjects extremely difficult and would have compelled frequent changes. He therefore uses a real answer in the final work. In both his real and tonal subject options, however, scale degrees 1 and 5 of D minor respectively frame the subject and answer. As we've seen then, in most fugue examples, scale degrees 1 and 5 are incorporated in some way into the subject answer pair. Occasionally, however, exceptions are found, such as here, where the real subject of this fugue begins with a leap from the 1st to the 4th degree of D major, and is then answered by a leap from the 5th to the 1st. Here, although scale degrees 1 and 5 are found in both subject and answer, the note combination in one is not found in a corresponding location in the other. For example, we've already seen this 5-1 leap and the answer uses degrees 1 and 4 on the subject, as does this 5-1 combination. Here then, Bach is using the subject at the subdominant level with only the underlying harmony rather than the harmony and inclusion of scale degrees 1 and 5 unifying the subject-answer pair. Along with the inclusion of scale degrees 1 and 5 in a subject's melodic contour, the underlying harmony, particularly those which begin and conclude the subject answer pair, is another extremely important factor in the construction of a fugue subject. This is especially true if the subject melodically suggests chords other than the typical tonic and dominant of a key. As we've seen in this fugue, for example, melodically the subject suggests G major subdominant harmony, but the underlying harmonies still essentially move between D major's tonic and dominant chords, thereby establishing that key. In other examples, the melodic contour of the subject answer pair more conclusively present the fugue's overall tonality, especially when combined with the underlying harmonies. In this real subject, for example, only tonic and dominant harmony is used to frame the subject answer pair. Here, although a secondary dominant is used to proceed E flat major's dominant, no modulation occurs and the tonic key is maintained for the entire exposition.
because of the nature of fugue subjects, often the dominant key will only be briefly tonicized during the answer entry before again returning to the tonic key for the next entry. This of course is dependent upon how many parts are included in the fugue. Here in this three-part fugue, where a tonicization of the dominant occurs, the tonic and dominant chords of both keys are still prominently used throughout the subject answer pair. C minor's tonic chord, for example, is here used as the pivot, sounding also as the subdominant in G minor. And here, where a modulation to E minor's dominant occurs, tonic and dominant harmony is again used, with both the subject and answer here framed by their tonic and dominant chords. E minor's dominant here also sounds as the tonic in B minor. A fugue subject and answer may overlap or may be separated by a link. The presence of an overlap and especially the resulting harmony where the overlap occurs influences whether composers use a real or tonal answer. In this fugue, for example, the subject's concluding notes and the accompaniment sound G minor harmony, the tonic chord in the key of G minor and the subdominant in the key of D minor. To accommodate this harmony, Pergolesi here uses a tonal answer, with the initial notes of the subject here expanded in the answer to a minor third, sounding G minor's first and third degrees. In this bar, then, the overlap of the subject and answer and the resulting harmony has influenced Pergolesi's choice for using a tonal answer. The G minor harmony also acts as a pivot between the tonic and dominant keys, with the dominant key here suggested but never completely established as the tonic key returns almost immediately with the subject entry in the bass. If a fugue subject and answer contain no overlap, a composer is free to choose either a tonal or real answer. In this fugue, for example, the subject's conclusion is connected to the beginning of the answer by a link, allowing Bach here to choose a real answer in the dominant key of D minor. When analysing fugues, to determine whether a subject and answer overlap, their duration must be established. In some fugues, this is fairly straightforward and can often be deduced by differences between the contour of subject and answer. Here, for example, the change in direction of these 16th note figures confirms the subject and answer conclude on the first 16th note of the subject's 7th quarter note beat. This can be further confirmed by the change in note values in the same location of the third entry. A subject's length can also be determined in using another method, the subject's voice leading. Along with the inclusion in many fugue subjects of scale degrees 1 and 5, often other voice leading strands will also be present. The presence of these strands not only reinforces the subject's underlying harmonic progression, thereby helping to establish the relevant key or keys, but they can also assist, as mentioned, in determining the subject's length. In this fugue, for example, voice leading strands in C major ascend 1, 2, 3 in the subject and 5, 6, 7 in the answer. As with many analytical contexts, often there is more than one way of hearing the voice leading of a fugue subject. In other words, more than one set of strands may underpin a subject-answer pair. 
Here, along with the framing first and fifth degrees of E-flat major, for example, this subject answer pair also includes this strand moving here between the first and seventh degrees and here between the fifth and raised fourth degree of E-flat major. The raised fourth here sounds as the third degree of the secondary dominant to B-flat major dominant harmony. Along with these strands, however, there is also another pair which essentially connect by step the framing first and fifth degrees. Here again, the raised fourth reflects the inclusion of secondary dominant harmony to B-flat major. And in this example, because scale degree 1 begins and ends the subject and scale degree 5 does the same in the answer, the contour of the subject and answer's central notes are shaped by a descent moving 3 to 1 in the subject and 7 sharp 6 5 in the answer. Once again, the sharpened scale degree reflects a brief move to another key, here the dominant of C sharp minor, however the tonic key is restored almost immediately for the next subject entry. I hope you found this useful. Thanks for watching. See you next time.